Hello, and welcome to episode three of the Painting Podcast. Art history from a painter's perspective. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the life and work of George O'Keefe and what other paths I may be taken down as I look over her life. So, Georgia O'Keeffe is a painter, American. Um, she's most well known for her paintings of close ups of flowers. For a while, she was doing New York skyscrapers, quite a contrast with the flowers. And she's also a, another landscape painter. She moved to New Mexico and did a lot of desert landscape paintings while living there. She she wasn't an outsider artist. She went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and after her studies there she went on to the Art Students League and for those that don't know the Art Students League of New York is kind of a it's an interesting institution. It's kind of amazing that it's you know continued to exist throughout the years seemingly unchanged and basically the the ethos of the Art Students League of New York as I understand it is that amateurs are allowed to study with people who are are very serious about painting that might want to make painting their profession or something they're obsessed with and so you've got these two disparate groups taking classes together. You can just take one class if you want. And I believe, I don't know what the prices are now, but I know they do make an effort to accommodate um, all different types of people from all different walks of life. So it's not known for being this expensive, you know, it is prestigious, but it's not known for being expensive. It's not like Yale, where you're paying, what, $100,000 for a degree now, probably more than that, 150000 So she goes to the Art Students League, and there's a lot of famous uh, painters who have taught here over the years. So even though that it has this sort of um, working-class spirit, Thomas Aikens taught there... Um, Thomas Hart Benton taught Jackson Pollock there. If you don't know Thomas Hart Benton's paintings, they're um, quite interesting. He's got these kind of rubbery figures organically um, flying through landscapes and undulating with the earth. But he was a, a primarily, you know, a representational painter. So a lot of different, you know, famous teachers have taught there throughout the years. And um, George O'Keefe goes there. And at the time, it was the beginning of the 20th century, so around 1900 or so, probably 1905 or something. And George O'Keefe goes there, and she's kind of, you know, she's not exactly in tune with everybody else. Um, at that point in time, a lot of people were still putting a lot of emphasis on drawing from life and observation and painting from observation. And all that's, you know, good for people starting out. These types of fundamentals are important. However, at, at George O'Keefe's point in life, that was something that didn't really interest her. And she also started you know, getting into the ideas from this this guy um, who was also a painter, but he was kind of a philosopher as well. And his name was Arthur Wesley Dow. And um, Dow was a guy that more or less believed that humans are a filter through which perception comes. So we all perceive the world in a little bit of a different way and looking at the world so scientifically 
might not make for the best art making, more or less. So you can read um, you can read his different books. One is actually just called A Series of Exercises in Art Structure for the Use of Teachers and Students. So he would write books about teaching art that were quite interesting around the same time, around 1900 or so. He also uh, made a lot of paintings of landscapes, which George O'Keefe would as well. So George O'Keefe starts getting into his ideas and philosophies and, you know, reading his books. And a lot of it has to do with creating a personal style. And that's another, you know, interesting concept. What is a personal style? Um, by the way, at the same time, she's also an illustrator. So she's working as a commercial illustrator, which I can only imagine must, must be a nightmare for artists, uh, judging by how much we enjoy doing commissions for other people. Usually we don't. So she's reading these texts, and she begins creating her own works. She's teaching in the mid-1910s, mostly in the South. She's kind of more associated with the South and the desert, even though she has a very strong you know, New York City connection. She's photographed by Alfred Stieglitz, one of the most important early photographers in history. And so she's somebody who's got a strong connection in New York City, but she's not living there. She's living in Texas, in South Carolina, in Virginia. She later moves to New Mexico, of course. But she's got this really strong connection to these parts of the world. They're hotter. They're more desolate. They're a little bit more brutal, I think, in some ways. She's not living in California necessarily. Even New York City, yeah, it can get hot in the summer, but we don't think of it as a really brutal climate like Alaska or, you know, the you know, the the desert of Arizona or New Mexico. So, George O'Keefe would be somebody that Moved, uh, moved around a ton in her early life. She was actually born in Wisconsin, and her parents were not necessarily rich by any means. They were just farmers in Wisconsin, dairy farmers, actually. And she would express an interest in art from a very early age. Around 10 years old, she states that she wants to become an artist, and her parents support her is quite nice and they find somebody in the community who does watercolor paintings to help teach her how to paint she goes on to paint and draw a lot as she's growing up in her early years so she's getting a lot of just practice things that we would associate with the fundamentals of art she's doing a lot of observation this sort of stuff and she gets to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And during her time there, she's, you know, the top of her class while she's there. However, she gets sick, and this causes her to stop her studies. So she stops studying there, and she ends up in New York City after getting better. She hated the smell of turpentine. She would say that it would make her sick. And she wasn't able to, to paint for, for a period of time as well. So she ends up at this Art Students League in New York City. And it's here where she's studying with these amazing professors, people like William Merritt Chase. You should go look at his paintings. And as I spoke about previously, she ends up leaving the Art Students League because she's kind of fed up with this observational approach. She starts teaching all over, and she's not only teaching, but she's also, you know, heading up these programs, which I imagine in 1910, for a woman to be not only teaching a class, but to be the head of a program, would probably turn a few heads. However, I hope that any doubts they had about her abilities, because she w was a woman, were, were swiftly 
chopped up into little pieces as soon as they saw her painting or drawing abilities because she was somebody that was very good just at observational painting. So she ends up in New York City. She goes back, you know, she's teaching everywhere. And around 1918 or so, she starts this relationship with Alfred Stieglitz, who would later become her husband. And Stieglitz was around 20 years older than she was. He was very well established. He ran a gallery in New York City called 291. And this gallery was bringing in some of the most important artists from Europe. So it was really the place where the East and the West collided, so to speak, was at this man's gallery. So George O'Keefe is in a really unique and amazing position in many ways because she's able to live in New York City and also be part of this amazing community of artists and also just be able to see new paintings from Europe. So Cubism, of course, is alive and well at this point. And these, these paintings are coming. Stieglitz is bringing in a lot of the avant-garde and a lot of the abstract painters from Europe. He's bringing them to America and showing them in America, often for the first time. So he's literally at the front line of what's happening in the art world. So George O'Keefe gets to be surrounded by all of these artists, including people like Arthur Dove and Madsen Hartley, who are both really interesting people to look at. I would suggest you look at Arthur Dove's paintings from around 1910 to 1920, and he would often do these very abstract, stylistic works from nature. So other people are doing this at the same time. And who knows if I imagine George O'Keefe, you know, would see these paintings that were being shown at her husband's gallery. And they're all kind of making similar work at the same time. And George O'Keefe would begin to take a magnifying glass and just look at rocks and leaves and all these sort of things. And she would just paint from them. She would use these magnified images as source material for her paintings. However, there's, you know, obviously a very stylistic mark that O'Keefe makes as well. She tends to have colors just slowly blend into one another. That's one thing that she's well known for. These colors just slowly getting lighter, then darker, and going into a whole and you know because of that even in the 1920s people were saying this looks like female genitalia and O'Keefe was like no <laughs> um, it's just flowers more or less so her work's already being taken down that realm and of course you know natural subjects can obviously have similarities and looking at these flowers I think in my view the way I look at it it's almost like a fractal where you look at a cloud and if you zoom into a cloud you kinda see a miniature version of that bigger cloud and if you look at a flower if you're getting up closer to the flower you still really can feel the flower itself like the essence of the flower itself, you know, the smaller fractal of the flower. And if you zoomed in again, you would probably see a similar image. So she's painting leaves and flowers and rocks. And around the same time, we're getting into the, the 1920s now, around the same time, there's this art movement that comes up in America called precisionism. And precisionism is essentially it's one of the first modern art movements in the United States and basically it's cubist work 
and it's often depicting landscapes, skyscrapers, bridges, factories, all these sorts of things. Um, and so precisionism is something that America is making its own. Of course, the Industrial Revolution as well is happening. And so a lot of rural areas are now being industrialized and they're seeing these giant factories go up and all this sort of stuff. Charles Sheeler would be a big proponent of this type of artwork, as well as Charles DeMuth, if you want to look at a couple artists and see their paintings. So George O'Keefe is beginning to be influenced by a very American version of abstraction. She's got her other filters involving nature, which are extremely important to her. She has a history of living in the South and living in very natural environments. However, she's moving back to New York City. So she's somebody who really can walk in both of these worlds quite well. And she can also make work about these places and bring them to New York. Of course, later on she would be making paintings of skulls and lands, desert landscapes and these sort of things. So she's somebody that can interpret that world and bring it back to New York City and also have a very palatable work for people interested in cutting edge abstraction. So in my mind, she's somebody that's really quite amazing for an ability to make this work far away from New York City but have it resonate so much. It's probably hard to do even today. In the late 1920s, George O'Keefe would travel to New Mexico with her friend Rebecca Strand. Rebecca was a self-taught painter, also married to a photographer. And while she was there, she, she went to Taos and stayed with a woman who uh, Mabel Luhan was her name, and she provided the women with studios. And during this time, O'Keefe was known for going on a lot of hiking trips, exploring a lot of places, and uh, she, she had just got her license and uh, a Ford, I think probably like a Model A or something like that. So you can imagine George O'Keefe driving around the desert in a Model A would be quite the sight to see. She would often do it by herself as well. But there's also this collision happening of New York City and the desert, obviously living in one of the most tightly packed with people places in the world, New York City, and going to the desolation of the desert must be quite an experience. And while she's in New York City, during the rest of the year, she's living in the 30th floor of this hotel and so she has this beautiful view of New York City and she's making a lot of skyscraper paintings that she becomes well known for but just think about her as a painter that type of versatility is is something that we don't often see today today we often associate painters with one thing and oh people like this so I'm gonna keep doing that but George O'Keefe was somebody who made these abstract paintings of close-ups of flowers, and then she also made these precisionist skyscraper paintings. And then later on, not even that long uh, after that, it was mid-1930s, she would start making those paintings of skulls kind of levitating in the center of a canvas with a landscape and clouds in the background. Later in life, of course, she would make um, some cloud paintings as well, which were looking down on the clouds as if the person was in an airplane. So she was somebody that was extremely versatile, and she was also doing well. Her husband, Stieglitz, was selling stuff for a lot of money. It's reported, I think it was like $35,000 or something like that, 
which back then would be a significant amount of money to sell a painting for. So Stieglitz is selling these works. She's doing okay. She's got an apartment with a beautiful view of New York, New York City. She gets to travel with her friend to New Mexico. And she's creating work that people want to buy. And we don't even know. Maybe Stieglitz lied about how much she sold that first painting for. It's kind of hard to tell. But nonetheless, he sold it, probably boosted the value of her work. She was having retrospectives in New York City already in the 1930s. And then around 1934 or so, she finds out her husband is having an affair with another woman who's also part of this art circle of friends, probably somebody she interacted with quite often. And this was really devastating to her. And she went into a deep depression. She was actually hospitalized for it. And she didn't paint for years as a result of this deep depression that she went into. So she was kind of on top of the world in, in a lot of respects. However, at the same time, definitely had some personal troubles and obstacles that she had to deal with as well. A little bit later on, um, people are starting to get kind of, they, they're starting to think she's becoming derivative, almost. So they're, by the mid-1930s or so, people are, people are basically, I mean, as if she hasn't gone through enough, she's just getting out of a psychiatric hospital. And critics are saying, you know, you're just pumping these paintings out. She was selling them for a lot of money, and people are like, you know, does she, does she even care about making these paintings? Is she just trying to make more money? So people are writing about that sort of stuff. And as a result, the value of her work does go down a little bit. So that's also not exactly something that's going to help her during this state in her life. And so she actually gets on a boat and goes to Honolulu in the night, uh, late 1930s, which is, you know, can you imagine just getting onto a boat? I can't imagine how long it would take, but it's probably like a month or something. <laughs> I don't know. But so she's on a boat. She's gone through all this stuff. She has this unbelievably close connection to the natural world. And she jumps on a boat, and she's like, I'm going to, to Hawaii. And she goes to Hawaii, and she lives there for a little bit. And sh while she's there, she just paints flowers and landscapes again. And she has all these beautiful paintings. I think she was being paid by, like, the Dole Food Company or something like that. She was supposed to, like, bring back pineapple paintings. And she didn't even bring back any pineapple paintings. They probably paid for the trip. And she, she came back with all these other paintings, typical, you know, for an artist to do. And so she comes back. She's got this whole new body of work. She's having more and more ret retrospectives one at the Art Institute of Chicago. She's the first woman artist to have a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art uh, begins to catalog her work in the mid-1940s or so. So she starts, she's very, very well known while she's living. So why not just stay in New York? Nope, that's not what she does. You can imagine this is, this is a woman who has a real passion for these things, and perhaps the, the backstabbing world of New York City was really not to her liking too much. So she moves to this place called Abiquiu in uh, around 1940 or so, and she's doing paintings of her house while she's there. This is where she makes some of those cloudscape paintings later on. 
and this is where she would stay. So during this time, she's still making stuff, still creating quite a bit of work consistently, similar styles. It's taken from her life. It's often taken from, you know, her paintings of the house are this stucco kind of brick. And just really, you should be in awe of her versatility to create. Now she's doing, you know, landscapes. Now she's doing a painting of a stucco house in the desert. Now she's doing a painting of a skyscraper. Now she's doing paintings just of clouds. Now she's making abstract works. Just a real force to be reckoned with in a lot of ways. So uh, Stieglitz, Stieglitz dies um, around mid-1940s or so. And she goes back to New York for a little bit and deals with, you know, his estate. He's probably got a, a zillion paintings he's got to deal with. So he, uh, he dies in around the mid-1940s. And after that, after she takes care of his estate and all that sort of stuff, she's basically like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with this. I'm going to New Mexico. And so she goes to Abacu and her little house and her little studio. She had nicely renovated, I'm sure. I've never seen it, but I imagine it was, considering the amount of money she had, probably a very nice house in a community of basically zero people. Even, you know, this isn't, I think there's like one school in the entire city. So she goes back to this house and she's painting canyons and the skyline and all these sort of things. And she's continuing to make this work in the 50s, continuing to make this work in the 1960s, continuing to make this work in the 1970s. She actually lives to be 98 years old, and she still can't stop making watercolors. So all those critics and people are, who are concerned, oh, she's just making paintings to sell them. Uh, yeah, she's you know 95 years old and still has the desire and feels the need to make watercolor paintings. So her life would come to an end in 1986, and her body would be um, cremated, and her ashes were just spread around the desert in the area that she loved so much called the Ghost Ranch. So thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you like this sort of thing, hop over to Painting Course on YouTube. You can watch my tutorials there and see the other po podcasts. I'll also be making a painting based on a George O'Keefe painting that you can watch as well. So stay tuned for more and subscribe, and I'll be talking to you soon. Thanks.